Well, good morning. Good morning. I know it's some of your first times here. Um, I want you to know this is also my first time at a women's Bible study. So, welcome. Um, Welcome to the Encounter Faith Podcast, everybody. So, um, as Heather mentioned when we started, one of the goals of this time is just for us to be able to have conversations about uh, each sermon and dive a little bit deeper into the context of the Generosity Initiative as you guys jump into uh, your small group discussion in a little bit. Uh, so today, we get to be joined by Pastor Tara Beth, um, and I'm about to ask some deeply personal questions that are frankly none of my business. Um, I love telling jokes like that because like the six of you who know me well started laughing first, and then there was a few people who like looked over like, oh, it's safe. He's kidding. Okay, good. Um, but thank you for doing this. Thank you for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. And it's so good to see all of these women. I love women's Bible studies, especially in the fall. There's just such a specialness in the fall. We're all excited. Um, The fall leaves are changing, and we are hungry for God's word. And we truly believe that this study and this journey that we are going on as a church is drenched in the word of God and will be profoundly formational. So thanks for being here and leaning in. So where I want to start um, you had mentioned this in the beginning of your message yesterday, but or on Sunday, but you, you, we call this a generosity initiative. And there's a lot of folks here who have not only walked with Good Shepherd Church through various generosity initiatives, but have also walked through uh, what we would ca- would have called capital campaigns. So just to kind of level set expectations, can you help folks understand what the difference is between a generosity initiative and why this is the time for our church to lean into that? I love that question. You know, one of the things that I've been saying to our staff, uh, anytime we hear capital campaign, I say, oh no, that's a bad word. That's a dirty word. We don't say capital campaign. Uh, And that is not that there's anything wrong with capital campaigns, but for us, it's a very different framework and a very different uh, end goal. So if you think about the uh, traditional capital campaign, uh, you would rally the congregation together to build capital towards a particular project. You know, so maybe you want to put a bell in the steeple, which I want to do. We need a bell in our steeple. Do we not? C-Mac, write that down. We need a bell in the steeple. Like, I love, like, neighborhood bells that go off. It would just be so beautiful. Okay, I digress. With that. And so so you you say, okay, a new bell is going to cost us... $600,000. $600,000. Sure. Okay. You're looking at me like I know the cost of bells. I fi- yes. You do know a lot of things. <laughs> and so I just, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, and so then you raise money and, and then you, you put in the bell. And that's a wonderful thing. And Good Shepherd has gone through many capital campaigns uh, for the glory of God. And we stand on the shoulders of those who have faithfully provided for us so we can experience the fruits of that. And a generosity initiative is a little bit of a different twist, if you will. For us, the end goal is discipleship, that hearts would be formed, that people would learn to have a relationship with money um, in the ways that God intended us to have a relationship with money. It's often said that that we shouldn't be talking about money in churches. And just like people say, we sh- you, you don't talk about politics in churches, you shouldn't talk about money in churches. And, you know, that's always kind of wild to me when it comes to money, because Jesus talks about money a whole lot. And it seems to be a pretty big deal to Jesus. And even in the Old Testament, we we read a lot about money. We read a lot about resources. And so for me, if Jesus thinks it's a big deal, then we ought to think it's a big deal. We believe that resources are a blessing, a wonderful blessing, that they are not a bad thing. Money is actually a gift. Money is a good, good thing. Uh, Money provides uh, warm homes. Money provides comfort. Money provides vacation and lasting and family memories. Money provides new appliances that we feel really good about. Um, Money provides great hair that I get from Tara Wolford over here. Uh, Money provides just, it's good things. And money can also become an idol. 
just like all very good things that are blessings from above, we can tilt it um, and put it on its head of what God in originally intended it to be, and it be can become wrongly ordered in our lives, okay? And so there's this, it's this idea of something called a wrongly ordered gift, meaning God provides gifts, God provides blessings, but God wants these things to be in a very particular place in our life. Sometimes we wrongly order them, and we begin to worship them. And this is a very real temptation in our world. It is a temptation for me. Uh, our family, Jeff and I, we talk about money a lot. We talk about budgeting. We talk about goals. We talk about dream dreams. And we're constantly having to assess how is our relationship with money right now? Because the place that God desires for money and resources to be in our lives is to be ordered within the kingdom of God. That is recognizing that all gifts, all resources come from God. So how do we steward our resources well so it doesn't only prop up our lives, but we view our resources as a way to partner with God for the mission of God. We are called to make disciples of all nations, uh, make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. Uh, we are called to live our lives on mission. Not one of us as Christians are off the hook. All of us are called to live missionally. Um, missions isn't a trip. Um, missions is a lifestyle that we are called to join God with, and our resources are included in that. And so how can we use our resources to advance the mission of God for the glory of God? Which is why this is a seven-week journey, a discipleship journey, where we are asking God to examine our hearts. And with that, we are saying, how, Lord, can we use the resources that exist within the people of Good Shepherd Church to partner with you for the mission of God. Yeah, that was a good word. You know, I don't, I don't normally have a studio audience here, so I was expecting like an applause break in that moment. I'm going to be honest with you guys. Um, thank you, one person who followed, <laughs> followed directions. I'm proud of you. Yeah. Um, here's why I wanted to start there, because you had mentioned this as well. There is this knee-jerk response that folks have, regardless of your relationship with the church, regardless of your relationship with this particular church, that when you hear a pastor start talking about money, there's a little bit of like, oh, I hope this doesn't get weird. And what I appreciate about the heart of everyone who's been involved in this conversation is it starts with discipleship. It starts and it's all about discipleship. And financial resources are a vehicle. I remember uh, having some quiet time with God uh, beforehand, and this is just... As you can tell, like uh, comedy is a worldview for me, and I often feel like that's how God speaks to me too. And having this moment where I'm like talking about this initiative, and God being like, "Yeah, how else would I have gotten your attention?" Yeah, you know, and I, and I just want to say, like, we know that there are a lot of women um, that come to Tuesday my morning Bible studies that have different churches. Yeah, and we still believe this is for you. And our end goal is definitely not that you will give to Good Shepherd Church. Okay. We have a very, I have a very deeply strong conviction that our first fruits always go to our local church. That is a deep conviction that I have um, that is rooted in scripture, that our first fruits always go to the local church. That is how Jeff and I practice. Um, it goes to the local church. So my prayer for you is if you call another church your home, is that, that God would shape your heart and that maybe you would be giving in new ways to your local church. And so don't see this as, as something that we're trying to do only for here. We want to shape the hearts of all people uh, to live life generously for the advancement of the mission of God. Yeah, that's good. So a tagline that's kind of emerged about this initiative is moving forward in faith. And what I'm curious about is why does it require faith in order to move forward? Yeah, it requires so much faith in order to move forward. One of my favorite passages of scripture comes from Hebrews chapter 11. It's the faith hall of fame. Has anyone ever read it? If you haven't, write this down. And I'm telling you, it will give you a double shot 
uh, of encouragement and edification. Hebrews chapter 11 is the Faith Hall of Fame, and it goes through all of these examples of people who move forward in faith. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 talks about Noah, uh, who was called to build this ark uh, before a, a torrential downfall of, or, of rain. And what did he do? He moved forward in faith, not having any idea what the final outcome would be. Abraham uh, was called to move to a land that was not his own. He was a nomad. He had very little context uh, for who Yahweh was. And yet, he moved forward in faith. And if you read throughout Scripture, every single time uh, we see the advancement of the story of God, people had to take leaps of faith. They had to move forward in faith. And I think it's really easy in... uh, in the burbs, if you will, where we have a lot of comfort, we're not, we, we don't live lives that require us to have to move forward in faith. Yeah. We move forward, but we're, it's, it's often comfortable. And I believe that God, there's this formational, when we don't take these leaps of faith, we are missing out on profoundly formational moments in our faith. Uh, we are missing out on the Lord doing that deep kind of surgery work in our hearts and our minds when we do things, and in particular with finances, because that's a scary one. Uh, we, are, we are surrendering our finances to God, and we're saying, God, this feels scary because uh, I've, never, I've never given money away like this, trusting that you're going to take this for your glory, and it's a leap of faith. You know, and I believe that the mission of God always requires moving forward. Read the book of Acts. Oh, my goodness. I mean, they are just on fire taking crazy risks, taking crazy leaps of faith. And God is always calling them to move forward. I I believe that one of the most dangerous things a Christian and a church can do is say, no, I'm good. Hmm. Put our stake in the ground. We're, We're comfortable. Like, we're good. Like, we've just been doing the thing that we've always been doing, and it's been working, and we're comfortable, and... I think that's a really dangerous posture to have before the Lord because God is a God of new things. God is a God of new wineskins. We serve a God that is the Holy Spirit, that is fresh wind, that is fresh fire, that is always stirring holy mischief and the hearts of God's people. And when we catch on to that holy mischief, watch out and we will see miracles, we will see signs, we will see wonders. Yeah, amen, yeah. So... In your message, you talked about there's part of this that is tied to freedom Mm. and uh, freedom from forgiveness, freedom from boasting, freedom in how we move forward. And I want to start with this, the freedom of boasting, because like you just said, it is very easy for us to go, uh, even in our personal lives, hey, that, you know, this works. I don't need to change. And you kind of get comfortable in a spiritual practice or a spiritual routine. And the routine stops uh, creating a spiritual momentum in your life. And God is a God who's on the move. What I'm curious about is to talk about boasting first. There's a difference between boasting and celebrating. Yeah. How, how do we define those differences? Because you talked about the need to let go of some of that boasting. But that doesn't mean we let go of all of the good things that God's done. Right. Yeah. So this, this context Our theme verse for this generosity initiative comes from the words of the Apostle Paul from Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 through 14, where he says this very peculiar thing, where he says, forgetting the past and moving forward and pressing on. And it's really important to set up that that's a really weird thing to see in Scripture, to forget the past. Because when you look at the entire arc of the story of God, God is always telling people to remember So why would the Apostle Paul say forget? Well, I think he's getting at very particular things. For Paul, forgetting is about moving away from the things that are keeping us in bondage. It's moving away from the things uh, that are keeping us chained up from living the abundant life that Jesus called us to live when he said in John 10.10, I have come that you may have life and life to the full. I believe that there are very real things in our lives that keep us from living that full life. And one of those things is boasting. 
Uh, in fact, before the Apostle Paul says forgetting the past, in the very beginning of Philippians chapter 3, uh, in Philippians chapter 3, maybe in your small group time, you could read it. It's great. Read, read verses 1 through 21. It's fantastic. Um, he says, hey, listen, if anyone has any reason to boast, I have more. And then he goes through a resume. And then you know what he says? Eh, but it's all rubbish compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. It's all rubbish. Now, I believe that God wants us to have freedom from boasting, that that's not a posture that God wants us to have as Christians and as churches. Have you ever gone, and I, I mentioned this on Sunday, and it's worth noting again, but have you ever gone to a high school reunion and you still hear someone talking about that one football play that they had, their junior year of high school? Or well, maybe so we're not supposed to do that. Well, I know you can't talk about it, okay. but like, have, you know, like when the person, like they always bring it up yeah. uh, and it's like, dude, like, are there other good things that God has blessed you with? And not that that's a wonderful thing, but sometimes we look back to the glory days of something that God blessed us with to begin with, right? Like all good things come from above. It becomes dangerous when we wrongly order good things, okay? And sometimes we can wrongly order them and we can claim it as though we did it and we start to boast about it. And we do this as Christians. Well, 40 years ago, you know, our church did this and we don't, we're good now because we were so good then or, or 40 years ago, I did. And we just kind of get stuck in the accomplishments of the past and we boast about them and we have this arrogance about them and we claim it as though we accomplished it when it was God's gift to us all along. Amen. And so boasting can keep us from living this abundant life that God has called us to live. And I believe that God wants freedom for us from boasting. Yeah. I love that because I'm someone who gets the chance to, I don't know if you guys have met me or my son, but we talk a lot, right? And what happens for me is that it becomes so easy for me to fall into that temptation of let me tell this cool story about this thing that happened previously and then as you said on Sunday begin to become defined by it and when we do that and you said this we miss all of the things that God's doing in our life presently we miss all of the different ways that he's blessing us and all the different ways that he is moving us forward because we have our minds fixed on this was this thing that happened then and I don't have to continue to progress a buddy of mine is a worship pastor and he deals with this in so many of these different churches that he operates in where he will show up at a church and they will say, man, you should have been here in 1998. And he's like, I was seven. Um, <laughs> but it is this easy thing to do because God has blessed uh, so many churches, our church included, so abundantly. It becomes so easy to want to remember it and having to remember in the right order is this really practical thing that we can hold on to as we move forward in, in the series and even in our own personal walks. The, thing, the other thing you talked about, though, was the idea of having freedom from forgiveness. There's these things that um, you had this quote about how we hold on to and become defined by and beholden to things that we've done that were wrong or things that were done to us that were wrong. And I think that's, that's really important. I want to ask about you know, how we walk that out in a day-to-day -day life. But the other thing that I think is part of that is just the daily hard parts of life. Not these big dramatic things, but just the sense of we are broken people living in a broken world. How do we find that freedom that we're describing in this sort of constant deluge of life is just hard? First, I have to apologize. I have have fresh coffee running through my veins. And I'm like so excited about this conversation. I'm like ready to start pacing the platform and preaching. And I know this is a podcast. Yeah. But you know, every single morning when my boys walk out the door, um, there's a few things that we do with them. We, we say, what's the most important thing that you do today? And, we, and they say, love God, love your neighbor, try your hardest. Then we lay hands on them and we pray them for them. And then as they are walking out the door, we say to them, you are a child of God. You are not defined 
by your grades. You are not defined by the hurtful things that people say to you. You are not defined by your status within the school. You are not defined uh, by how good you are at a sport. And this is so important because as Christians, we are defined as children of God. We are defined by the blood of Jesus. We are defined that we are beloved, that we are known, that we are seen, and that we are loved. And so with that, the kind of freedom that the Apostle Paul wants us to be free from is freedom from being defined by the things that have hurt us, freedom from being defined by um, people that have done hurtful things to us, freedom from being defined uh, by the addictions that keep us confined, freedom from being defined of, of the hurt that we have caused to others. And this is true individually, and this is true corporately. And I think bitterness is such a real one. I mean, for me, that's that's not an easy one for me. I've had some hurtful things happen to me. And bitterness is wild because, you know, someone does something to you that is hurtful. Someone says something to you that is hurtful. And, like, we take this, like, pill of bitterness and we swallow it when we think of their names as like a poison. And somehow we think that we're punishing them, but really we are punishing our own hearts by putting these kinds of toxins in our heart and our mind. And I tell you what, I believe the Lord was testing me on Sunday because right after I preached that sermon, someone sent me a friend request on Facebook from my past, and I thought, oh Lord, I have to accept this friend request. Uh, Because it was someone that had caused a lot of hurt for me in the past. And I thought, man, this is something God, like God just sent me this message. Like God wants freedom for me. God wants freedom for all of us. We don't have to be defined from the pain and the hurts and the hangups of the past. We are children of God and we are set free from the blood of Jesus. And we have been given the spirit of Pentecost. Where, Where the spirit of Pentecost, there is freedom. Where the kingdom of God is, Jesus tells us that whatever is loosed is in in heaven and will be loosed on earth. And so that is the kind of freedom that we are praying for freedom here in your life as it is in heaven. Golly. I should not drink coffee before a, a podcast. Gosh, my goodness. Ugh. I highly recommend all of you start your own podcast so you can have conversations like this as part of your job because, oh my goodness, I love, I love the example of the friend request because I think it is easy, especially for folks who live in the burbs, who have the kind of lives that we have to assume that it requires a more dramatic, for lack of a better term, story for these things to be applied. And the reality is this is work that all of us need to do in every, in the daily friend requests of life um, in order for us to begin to live life to the full. I got two more questions. So let's say someone's listening, they've identified that this is a thing. They've been defined by something in their past. They've that is holding them back. I'm always hesitant in conversations like these because Pastor Terabeth talks about this vision of freedom and living life to the full, and it she communicates so well it almost begins to sound idealistic. But it's very real and very obtainable for each of us. What I'm curious about is what are some of the ways, like sort of the mile markers towards that freedom that people can begin to identify where maybe they are still defined by it, but they're not as defined as they were the day before. Yeah, you know, I think prayer is remarkable. Oh, I just, I don't even know where I would be without just being able to commune with the Lord in prayer. The Apostle Paul talks about in Romans chapter 12, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We often think that prayer is only about convincing God to act. But the most amazing byproduct of prayer is the renewing of our minds that happens. And when we discover the gift of contemplative prayer, of just sitting in the presence of the Lord and praying, and asking God to hold up the mirror, asking God to reveal to you why this makes you so mad, Why this makes you so sad? You know, it's just two days ago, I found journals that I haven't laid my eyes on in 15 years. I thought they were lost, actually. 
Um, These are journals uh, from before I was married. Um, And I've always really, really been a passionate prayer journaler. I journal out my prayers, and that's how I practice contemplative prayer. And as I was scrolling through these journals, I started reading them to Jeff, and I was just in awe of the renewing of my mind that God had taken me through in some of these events. And so I think that's, that has to be the starting point, because when it comes to freedom, we don't free ourselves. As we, we just don't. Um, it is the Spirit of the Lord The Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. It is the spirit of the Lord. And so if you are stuck, if you are stuck um, in a toxic relationship, if you are stuck with toxic thoughts, if you are stuck um, in a habit that you know is not a godly habit, maybe you have the habit of tearing other people down in conversations, um, Maybe you have the, the habit of slandering someone, or maybe, maybe you're just really stuck because someone from the past has really hurt you. Go to God. I mean, there's so many examples. Even when it comes to maybe you're stuck about a sin of the past, something that you've done. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us of all unrighteousness, which means the moment we forgive, for, confess our sins, there's freedom there's forgiveness. And you don't have to return to that again and torture yourself anymore. You are free and you are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I can't believe you guys pay me to do this. Okay. Um, I want to end sort of where we started talking about us as a church because you and I have had this conversation a lot about the kind of church that we can be. And it connects back to this conversation for me because if we are moving forward in faith as individuals, if we are finding this kind of freedom in groups like this, if we are, for lack of a better term, getting this right, I'm curious, how do you think, hope, pray that people who aren't a part of this church talk about this church? I have said in some settings, and I know, like I always get into trouble with being such an idealist. I, I have so much hope for the church. Um, I really believe in the church. Why do I believe in the church? Because I believe Jesus believes in us. Jesus prayed for us. And the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was talking about us. Jesus had an imagination for the church of the future, and there's so much rich biblical theology on why I believe this. And I believe that Jesus still believes us, even though the world tells us that the church is in in decline, even though so many people talk about the decay of the witness of the church, and for very good reason, even though we know that people are deconstructing for very good reason, even though there is church hurt for very good reason, and I have so much empathy and so much care for that, and I want the church to own some of those things, and also at the same time, Jesus so passionately and so profoundly believes in us, is interceding before the Father right now on our behalf, is praying before the Father right now on our behalf, and really still believes in this vision of the church that we are to be an embodiment of the already but not yet kingdom of God. What are the fruits of a church that I dream of? It looks a lot like Revelation chapter 21. In Revelation chapter 21, it talks about that someday there will be a world of no more sorrow. Someday there will be a world of no more tears. There will be a world of no more pain. There will be a world of no more cancer. There will be a world of no more injustice. There will be a world of no more racism. There will be a world of no more political divisiveness. There will be a world of no more fighting and toxicity and gossiping and slandered. And we don't just sit on our hands and say, well, that'll be nice when that world comes. But instead, 
We are people that says, may your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And so we believe that that future reality is not just a someday reality, but we tilt our lives towards that reality. And we say, if someday there's going to be a world of no more sorrow, then we are going to be a church that goes into the dark places of this world. We are going to be a church that goes into the sorrowful places of this world and offer hope and healing. That we believe if that there will be a world of no more sickness, then we are going to visit the sick. We are going to lay hands on those who are sick, and we are going to pray for healing, and that the Holy Spirit would provide comfort for those who are grieving. If we believe that there will be a world of no more racism, then we are going to move into those places in this world, and we are going to be leaders of reconciliation. We are going to be bridge makers, and we are going to take no part in making greater divides in this world, because we pray, may your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And that is the kind of church that I pray for. That is the kind of church I dream about at night. That is the kind of church that makes my heart beat hard with excitement, that makes me actually want to weep in prayer, that makes me want to stand and dance and worship because I believe that that is the church that Jesus believes in. And that is the church that I believe that Jesus even believes that Good Shepherd can be. And that is why we want to be for the world, for our neighbors, and for every single person that comes into this place. We want them to know that the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven can be a reality. No, it's not fully realized. Yes, it's an already but not yet space, but we believe that we can taste it, that we can get glimmers of it, and that we can experience the power here and now. Call me an idealist. Yeah. There's nothing you're going to hear from me that's better than that. So... Ladies, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Can we give uh, Pastor Tara Beth a uh, hand again? We'll hand it back, back to Heather. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Encounter Faith Podcast. This podcast is a service of G. Shep Productions from Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Naperville, Illinois. All rights reserved. If you're in the area, we'd love to meet you on a Sunday morning at our 9 a.m. or 1045 services. At Good Shepherd, we are inviting everyone to walk together in the calling of Christ for a life of eternal impact. This podcast is produced and hosted by me, Ross Cochran, and our theme song is Wake the Earth by 1111 Worship. Thank you for listening. We'll talk again soon.